the incoming volley was predictable. If not, at least a little disappointed to see the same four grown-ass women engaging in the same callous, misguided outbursts. Why under earth would you teach an alchemical history at that very same elemental school that is so hollowed and revered by all who know it? Graviton, even being at once assailed of spitfalls, criticisms, rolled eyes, and indifference, it had little effect. With a simple Kajikimbo seven turn, volleys went by harmlessly. A few of the students seeming to boil at that. So I continued. Is there any more a dangerous thing than stupidity? One of the women began to raise her objection, but raising one finger as I often did, I caused a cessation of said interruption. Philosophy then. I continued, ready to expound upon the lecture I had begun. Now, I am certain, more so by the expressions I see now wore in this classroom, that it can be very deflating, disappointing, disheartening, depressing, defeating, one of the young ladies rolled her eyes, and beneath her breath muttered, Oh, fiery lord, he's doing the letters crap again. Not wanting to lose my momentum, I let that one go by. Besides, the irritation and rejection of this idea was a vital part of the lesson, so I did sally forth. You see, belief in one false principle is the beginning of all and wisdom. One of my brighter students, although not without a temperament in need of tempering, Bridget the Alabaster, or so she called herself, raised her premature objection. Mr. Hermes Sage, sir, I do beg pardon with my interruption. Her gestures and inflection couldn't be more clearly intended to insinuate a cultured refinement in her instructor that simply did not exist. Sure, I speak well but it is only a custom learned upon a long timeline. Her intention had been to insult and thereby get the better of her elder, but being how her remarks shot quite a wry diagonal the place I stand, unfazed. But she continued. The rest of the students, save the quiet one, were now utterly transfixed upon the exchange. Despite its failing to work, she continued with her bad acting. Well, you see, Mr. Sage, sir, it is simply that I failed to see what this philosophy has to do with the supposed non-existence of magic. She ended her little show with a flourish before resting her bald fists upon her hips, with a head cocked to one side as if impatiently waiting for an answer. You see, the thing to do in this situation, when one has unruly students just about to lose themselves in the chaotic disarray is to get straight to the point and deflate their horseplay with the bad news they would rather not hear. Firstly, I began barely looking up from where I had stood, awaiting my student to finish asking the question. Miss Saul, it's Hermes Satan. That's a singular proper noun, although history has done quite a worthy job of erasing that. Secondly, being as your question was not completely unfounded, I paused just for a moment to sound more clumsily my age. Well, let's get into it. You could see the light leaving the faces of the students create a darkness in the room. Wasting no time, I began again. A bottle of wine. Would you deem it necessary to both know the ingredients as well as the correct process to synthesize it in order to do so? A perplexed classroom nodded, clearly wondering where exactly this was going. Good then, you also agree that you must possess both the implements of its make as well as the ingredients therein? Nodding again, it seems some were now genuinely interested in the lesson at hand. Would you then also agree that using inferior means, wrong ingredients, and competence in the making, that these things could not only spoil the wine, but perhaps lead to disastrous results you had not yet anticipated? Some of the students began to fluster with impatience then, so I figured I would not be stringing them along for too much longer. But what if instead, you had synthesized a fine and brilliant barrel of poison? One that you had then dispensed into the local markets. Some of their faces seemed to turn nearly green at the thought. I was glad I had managed to impart an important lesson into them then. 
one that was nearly completed. That is why the statement, one false principle is the beginning of all unwisdom, is more than just a semantic argument. It has layers of specific relevance, and besides, I did not say that magic does not exist, but rather, it does not exist in the looser sense. Which besides, what well, we all know that science was once considered magic, and all that implies is that magic, for the most part, appears to the average hominin to not exist based on the typical awareness in which, as we know, I paused to the collective groan of a classroom that at once said, does not include all awareness. I couldn't help but smile a little. Uh-huh, very good. And that then presupposes that magic could possibly exist and could in fact be elusive and inaccessible to the average person. The singular applause I had heard before and did not suggest anything good, but of course under the general direction from where this intrusion came and was well was prepared when a coiling spire of icicles came flying through the area. With a slight side step, I reconfigured all the particles of the air to tug on the space-time slightly, so the snapping like a rubber band it deflected the flying ice as it fell shattering to the ground. The classroom stood in shock, most of them having yet to ever witness such a demonstration. It seemed the quiet student in the back had chosen this moment to make his presence known. Now, now, Lotar, as you know, in this classroom, I must maintain a certain measure of decorum. I am willing to overlook this slight transgression, but any further outburst will not be tolerated. His left hand glowing ever wider, his face flushed like a frozen surface of a lake seemed ready to set into screaming, but he relented. Fine. But I want to know. He paused. My student looked poised. Fine. I said. I'll allow it. Speak it then. He did not hesitate. Why do they call you the king of the mountain? End part two.